Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this meeting of the Planning Committee. I'm Jeanette Sochen, and I'm chairing the meeting. First of all, before the meeting starts, I have some announcements to make. There are emergency evacuation procedures that you must know about. In the case of a fire, a bell will ring continuously. If this occurs, please leave the building immediately, following the green fire exit signs out to the assembly point, which is by the War Memorial in Duke Street. If anyone requires assistance, please let me know. Lifts should not be used. Please remain at the assembly point and do not attempt to return to the building until you've been advised that it's safe to do so. The toilets are situated on the landing at the top of the main staircase and on the ground floor in the customer service area. Please turn off your mobile phones during the meeting. Anyone attending this meeting is entitled to film it but only councillors, officers, and anyone sitting around these tables may be filmed. Members of the public should not be filmed, so please ensure cameras are pointed only in this direction. This meeting is also being broadcast via YouTube and recorded. When speaking, please, May I remind the committee to ensure you turn on your microphone and speak closely into it, but not too closely so you, uh, we lose the, the sound altogether. A red light will appear on the middle button to indicate that your microphone is switched on. When finished speaking, please remember to turn your microphones off again. <coughs> okay, I'll start with apologies for absence. Uh, thank you, Chair. I've had apologies from Councillors Armstrong, Papa, Tron and Wilson, and Councillor Walsh is subbing for Councillor Tron. Thank, thank you. Item 4 is the minutes. The minutes of the 5th of March 2024. Is it your wish that I sign those as a true record of the meeting? Thank you. Right, declarations of interest. All members are reminded they must disclose any interest they know they have in items of business on the meeting's agenda or as soon as they become aware of the interest. Okay, moving on. Public question time. Is there anyone who's asked to speak at this point in the meeting? Um, not at this point, just on one of the items later. Right, when, when people do speak, each person has two minutes and a maximum of 20 minutes is allotted to early public question times. But there will be different um, needs for this particular area of the meeting, so you can speak when the item is called. Where, is it, where an application is returned to a committee that's been deferred for a site visit, for further information or to consider details, reasons for refusal, no further public questions or statements will be submitted, can be submitted. Right, moving on. I'll go straight to item six. Land east of Great Lees Race Court, course, London Road, Braintree, Essex. Can I have the officer's report, please? Thank you, Chair. I'll be presenting a short presentation today just to deal with um, the main, um, main issues related to the application. So as you'll note, um, the land is land east of uh, Chelmsford City Racecourse. Proposal before us is a provision of five um, service travelling show persons plots with ancillary um, development. Just to give some uh, policy context, obviously this report will be fairly succinct. There's an extensive officer report to supplement this item today. In terms of policy context, just give a flavour for the, the broad location. 
members will, will note that the blue star, the, the area um, in, in purple or the north north of this plan is the is the proposed show person's um, site. Members may be familiar with the rest of this plan, which is the uh, master plan for Great Lee Site 7, uh, approved in February um, of last year. Other elements to note in terms of the policy, obviously the, the report knows, notes the presence of the special policy area related to the race course. The report deals with, with, with that item. And also relevant to the strategic policies that um, seek to, uh, or part of the spatial strategy, seek to develop great lees in a particular way, a particular number of units, and included within those is a requirement for travelling show persons plots as, as other sites. Specific reference is made, as I said, to grow, growth site 7, and specifically 7A, where that requirement um, currently sits. Again, just a broad brush of, of, of flavour for the layout. Um, that red line to the left-hand side is just the red line application site to the uh, previous plan. The, the, the drawing to the right of that, you'll see the, the, the green and the, the darkened elongated blocks. That is just a colour-coded version which shows you the arrangement of the travelling show person site off London Road. So we have two access points shown in black there and the the elongated workshops are the predominant feature in terms of bookending um, the site itself, internal access road. So members will note this, this one's just part of the island site. I don't, I don't want to get too much into the history that is covered in the officer report, but only part of this, this island site noted because it falls between the 131 and London Road to access point internal road. Note there's tree retention related to the um, TPO uh, woodland, as well as to be supplemented with additional landscaping. Uh, this plan by no means shows the additional landscaping. It's just, just shown as, as green trees for the purposes of, of the layout. The um, drawing on the bottom right-hand side just gives a flavour. It, it, it is part of the agenda pack as well. gives a flavour of the size of the workshop buildings, agricultural appearance, uh, metal sheeted. Uh, those are the buildings that you see uh, within, within the main drawing. One of, one of the key items that... I just want to present to members at this point is neighbour relationship. Obviously, we do have a, a couple of comments, a um, couple of representations, objections to the application. A uh, key issue here is obviously neighbour relationship. The report goes through this, but just to give a flavour again, um, what we have on the left-hand side is, is an arrow just showing the, the distance. That distance is 50 metres. That arrow distance shows 50 metres to the back edge of Plot 5's workshop building to the site boundary to the north, which is Norwood, as you just see on that plan. That distance is to the site boundary. Obviously, what, what else we have are intervening trees, as you'll see on the right-hand photo, the top, top right, that's taken from the, the Garden of Norwood. We have some intervening trees as part of their own site, but also part of the, the preserved woodland within the application site itself. Um, that is, is then embellished with the, 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 the aerial photo shown at the bottom right. Uh, Star is, is Nor the Norwood property. As you see, there's a, a grouping of trees to the south of that. So this, just in terms of the neighbour relationship, obviously the officer report does run through that that is deemed to be acceptable in terms of the separation distance, but not only that, that's supplemented by the bookend design of, of the workshop building, including additional boundary treatments, which will include an acoustic fence uh, to the west and, and to the northern side and to the east of that building. Sorry, we're all considered to be an acceptable relationship with its nearest uh, neighbour. There is a neighbour slightly further north, but this is its close neighbour. No neighbours to the south of this site. So again, quick run through of all the um, the main planning considerations. Principle is, is debated extensively within the officer report. Um, that is deemed to be acceptable. Visual impact deemed to be acceptable. Also, highway safety. Um, those accesses have been reduced from the point of the master plan down to two. That is now deemed to be acceptable in terms of displays and, and movements along London Road. No relationships I've just touched upon deemed to be acceptable. And trees, 
obviously we do have some intervention in the um, the preserved woodland, but it seems to be acceptable and condition will cover their replacements. So the um, report before you members seeks approval, obviously resolution to be approved today, subject to conditions and the signing of a legal agreement. The details of that legal agreement are headed within the officer report and those are bullet pointed in terms of um, those items. Thank you, Chair. Happy to take any questions, obviously. Thank you. Are there any people to speak at this point? No, there was just one question that was circulated in advance to committee members yeah. this morning. Has but anyone seen not here that? to read that out. Yeah. And if you note, there are, there's a point on the green sheet as well. Right, we'll move straight over to the, the councillors who would like to start. Of course, it's quiet tonight. Thank you, Councillor Lee. Very simple one. Um, can you just confirm why this has come to committee? Yes, uh, thank you, Councillor. I think there's, there's generally been a decision taken historically that um, all strategic applications or elements related to strategic, strategic applications would come before planning committee. Obviously, this is not an allocated site at the moment, but obviously it does have some relevance to um, strategic growth site seven. So that decision is taken in terms of its relationship with uh, strategic growth site. Anyone else? Councillor Highland. Thank you, Chair. Um, can I just ask about the access to the road? Uh, that's quite a fast road as I understand it. Will these large vehicles slow down that road? Thank you, Chair. Happy to take that. Obviously, we do have with us today a um, member of the Highway Authority as well, so I'm happy to be supplemented in, in that respect. Obviously, just to give a, um, a, a broad uh, brush of the history here, obviously, as part of the master plan, there, were, there was a caveat at that point that the access points would be reduced to two because there was a concern about three access points, individual plot access from that road, um, increasing the number of vehicle conflict points. Um, so I think the history is that that has been reduced to reduce um, re reduce that potential. Obviously, bear in mind that um, this site can be accessed at the at the moment through the lawful uh, planning commission of the 2003 planning commission for the Great Lee Great Lee's Racecourse, um, subsequently called Chelmsford City Racecourse. So there are a number of access points um, along this uh, stretch and also along this application site that would enable cars to go into the site. So I think that. You know, the principle is accepted that um, of access points along this stretch. With specific regard to the size of vehicles, obviously these vehicles are uh, large vehicles and um, it, it's noted that the um, transport assessment has dealt with the largest vehicle that, that came to sort, which is the, um, the drawbar 18 metres um, in terms of that distance, so larger than the 16 metres that they would normally seek to audit. Um, in terms of uh, turning into the site as well as within the site. So a lot of work has been done in terms of not only reduction in, t in the number of access points, but work around the visibility space, for example. So highways have been consulted you know, o over a number of years now in terms of um, the ability of those vehicles to not only get into the site, get out of the site, but also turn within the site as well. So highways don't raise objection at this point, subject to conditions. In terms of the, the speed of the road, obviously at this particular section, it is 60 mile an hour, and it does, it does change to 40 mile an hour further north. So um, those audits have had to take, take into account that those vehicles do need to slow in terms of those turns in and out of, in and out of this site. Again, that has been audited by uh, consultee with Essex County Council. Just further to that, it is relevant to note that um, the applications that came at the same time as this that are referenced in the report, the 2021 applications, uh, are proposing as part of wider works, again enforced by the master plan, to reduce the speed limit along this stretch. Those um, detailed works are ongoing with ourselves, county, uh, and the applicants at the moment, but we're hopeful to get a scheme before uh, committee in the coming months. Um, on, on those items and that would effectively hopefully in the future reduce uh, the speed limit down to 40 if not 30 so I think it's a case of there's some history in terms of what the site can be used for um, the specifics of this application have been tested 
through the consultation with County Council, but also in the future that, that is proposed to be improved as well. So there's three elements I want to get across to councillors today. Thank you. Councillor Thompson, I think you had your hand up. Right, thank you. Is there any? Councillor Dobson. Sorry, thank you, Chair. <clears throat> um, I, I was going to ask about the speed, re speed limit reduction, but that one's already been covered. Um, the spare area between um, the neighbour and the site, what planting, what is proposed for that? I mean, is that, um, presumably, there's a, um, a tree management plan to replace anything that dies within a certain time or something. Um, what actually is planned for that area and how will that mitigate the um, imp impact of this site on the neighbour? Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Councillor. I think it's, it's fair to say at the moment, what, what we don't have is a formal landscape scheme before you, but I think the point that the officer report makes is that the relationship with the neighbour is, is not dependent upon additional landscaping here. Obviously, in our view, it would, it would assist, um, obviously, to locate on trees rather than, rather than glimpse a building. But there are a number of trees there, both within their site and the existing site. There has been some tree clearance because of uh, poor quality trees. So there is a condition that seeks a, basically a comprehensive landscape scheme. So I think that, obviously, we as officers would note that that's a, a prime opportunity for additional um, landscaping uh, as well as management. Um, the ecology report, again, as a condition tied to that, seeks for, for, for other measures as, w as well. So there's a potential for to supplement with, with ecological matters as well as um, additional tree planting. There is a commitment to both from the applicant. Obviously, you'll note that any trees to be lost will be compensated. Um, indicatively, we have seen trees on, on the western edges as well, uh, and, and also a commitment for the three trees per plot, in, in, in essence, as well. So I think, I think in answer to the query, we would obviously note the specific reference by yourself, Councillor Dobson, and obviously, you know, we can specifically steer additional landscaping if that's the, the wish of, of members today. But obviously, from, from my perspective, or as officer's perspective, it is a prime location in terms of its clearance. There is, there is, a, there is a void area between um, built form in terms of the workshop and the fencing. Uh, that 50 metre um, gap you know, is, is prime for additional landscaping as well as e e ecology improvements. Councillor Hartland. Thank you. Uh, this is probably not a planning consideration, but the, 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 the building that's closest to the neighbour, why was it put that way rather than that way alongside the road like the rest of them? Because I, I guess the noise impact from that workshop is going to be a great consideration to the neighbour. Yes, th th thank you, Councillor. The, the rationale put forward by the, the architects at the, at the time was it was essentially this, this bookend design so that you would basically create these bookends at the north and the south and, and have the other three uh, workshops parallel to the 131. I take the point that it, that it could have been done differently, but I think that what this does do is that, you know, we, we wouldn't get away from the fact that it would be glimpsed from Norwood to the north in any case, even if it was uh, parallel to the 131 on the western edge. I think that in this case, um, the building itself can provide a screen to other things south. It can also provide uh, additional acoustic barrier elements in terms of enclosing that use for things to its south. Obviously, there is a fence to its east as well, which would be an acoustic fence, which would supplement that. So I think it's a case of it, it, it could have been done either way. I think there's, there's pros and cons um, either way, but you know we're dealing with what's in front of us at the moment. Obviously, if there was a specific concern about that, then, then we could change it as part of the application. But obviously, bear in mind, we're dealing with what's in front of us at the moment. I think that the, the pros in terms of just enclosing that off and keeping um, activity to the south of the building, and obviously that building 
is not shown to have any windows on, for example, on its rear elevation. So, you know, we're not concerned about overlooking, for example, but it does allow the building to act as an additional noise barrier, in essence, to um, some activity that might go on on that plot. Ah, Councillor Large. Thank you, Chair. Um, I had a question about, um, so it's obviously sandwiched between two rows, the, the plot. And there is discussion in the, in the agenda pack about uh, the impact of noise and air quality on the, the people who will be living on the plot. So I just, but I wanted, wondered if there was more detail about what kind of acoustic barrier was proposed to, to protect their amenity. And also, I think I've understood from the air quality section that there was modeling done about the impact of the air pollution on the site itself and that that was, um, acceptable but I just wanted to check that that's what I had understood correctly thank you okay Th thank you council I'll just deal with those uh, points separately if I may um, in terms of in terms of the noise um, point obviously it is irrelevant in terms of you know the site context here um, you know there is there is background noise associated with the 131 to the west as well as uh, London Road to its to its east um, that, that has been assessed through reports. Obviously, we consult with our public health team as well. Um, there, was, there was no concerns specifically raised because of uh, the nature of, um, the, not only the proposal, but of the nature of the site context. Obviously, this, this strip of land north, as, as we uh, travel towards Young's End, there are interspersed properties as well. So th this is not, you know, the island site sandwiched between these two roads is not, you know, the point I'm making is that houses are not uncommon in this locality. It's not devoid of any any development. Also, the point made by, by public health is that, um, that they have requested um, a condition to deal with uh, noise in terms of acoustic barrier. There are details in the, in the application that, that detail uh, an acoustic fence, which is essentially a, a thicker panelled fence uh, that will go on west and, and, and north and, and, and south uh, plots in, in some cases, as well as intervening between the plots as well. So that is their recommendation to suppress as far as possible um, any noise. Obviously, the buildings would do an, an element of that as well. Um, so there's no concern. I think the, the, the take-out is, is that there's no objection from our public uh, health team in, in that respect. In terms of um, air quality, again, report submitted, no, no specific um, concerns raised by uh, our public health team, both in terms of um, its, its existing location, close to two roads. Obviously, we have a quarry uh, further nor northwest of, of racecourse activity. Um, and also the activity of the site itself. I think we can't get away from the fact that um, these are, by their very nature, have large vehicles, uh, have maintenance machinery associated um, with those. Obviously, at the end of the day, there is a choice made by residents to reside um, in close proximity to those uses, both within a tour, usually a touring caravan, a static caravan, in terms of the description of this development, but also the amenity block itself. So we do, do need to accept that you know there, there will be noise associated with with living on these sites. Um, that's the nature of, of, of what they are. Thank you. It looks fairly quiet now. If that is all the questions covered, Councillor Thompson. <laughs> Sorry, just, just one more question. It's probably a, um, just a very simple one, probably. Um, the legal obligations, I mean, once this um, site is approved and is developed, is there a legal obligation for it to remain in perpetuity or can it be um, changed at a later date, just out of interest? Um, it's perhaps not as simple a question as uh, as, 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 you, as you may have hoped, uh, Councillor Dobson. I think that what what the heads of a term seek seek to agree is that this site will be used uh, for travelling show person and, and and people that that meet the, that definition. Um, in terms of in terms of perpetuity, obviously bear in mind that this is a, a standalone application at the moment, not specifically related to or tied to site seven. Obviously, when um, officers present um, the seven A application, you know the, the allocation. Um, within which 
uh, a TSP site is is part of the allocation commentary. Um, I would anticipate, and I don't want to kind of um, a kind of preempt that legal agreement, but that would need some tie um, in terms of uh, what this site provides should it be approved, because in essence it relieves seven A current seven A of the requirement Morsham Hall side. So yes, yes, there will be a requirement that this stays for travelling show persons as part of this legal agreement, but that will also be um, not duplicated, but supplemented by a future obligation so that this site is then not lost um, in future. I hope that answers the question, but happy to expand further, Councillor. Sorry, Chair. Um, just really interested to see, you know, if it can. I mean, I know it's part of, of the whole master plan, and this is a kind of, I know, without going through all the policy considerations, it's kind of an extra added on bit to, to, to 7A. Um, I was just interested to know whether in 20 years' time, for example, whether if, if there was a legal agreement to keep the site as a TSP site or whether it, um, you know, there is a potential for it to be used for other uh, other reasons. But I'll, I don't really want to get into a great deal of it. Again, it's obviously not part of this application. I was just interested in how the legal agreements work. Sorry. So, okay, so in terms of, well, we do have a legal officer, uh, well, we have a legal officer here as well, but in terms of, in terms of perpetuity, obviously, um, bear in mind that even a legal agreement can, can be changed through an application in, in future, so it, it doesn't necessarily safeguard it forever, um, albeit that's what the wording could say. So I've tried to explain that, you know, the, the proposal before us would seek to secure this as the, as the TSP site and future applications before us would seek for that to deal with the requirement of site seven. So hopefully that could give you confidence that um, certainly short to medium term, that's what, it be, that's what it would be used for. Obviously, you know, beyond the 20 years, as you said, notionally, um, it doesn't restrict someone from applying um, or seeking to vary the legal agreements, but obviously there would need to be good planning reasons why we would, we, we would that to be acceptable in the future. I think it does say something somewhere in the papers, doesn't it, to confirm exactly what you're saying. Do you want to come in here? Only because I was fidgeting. Um, <laughs> just to reassure Councillor Dobson, in 20 years' time, if someone wanted to come along, they would need planning permission and they would need to vary the legal agreement. And at that time, the planning committee could have regard to all the relevant policies that are there in the future. So. Um, you can't just change it to something else on a whim without without planning consent. Thank you, everybody. Uh, unless anyone wants to go to the high roads um, representative, um, I shall move. Are you happy for me to move on? Yep. Okay. I move that subject to an agreement as indicated in the report pursuant to the Town and Country Planning Act 1990 that the Director of Sustainable Communities by be authorised to grant the application for the conditions on uh, page 25 to 33 of the agenda pack. Do I have a seconder? I do. Uh, all those in favour? I think that's NEMCOM. Right, thank you very much. Um, that application has been approved. Thank you. If you bear with us while we change uh, what is happening. Again, can I just mention there are two items on the green sheet. Perfect. Thank you, Chair. Um, can you hear me okay? I've lost the box that, and I'm quite tall, so standing up I've got a bit of a height difference. 
I can. It always feels a bit awkward. I'll, I'll sit down if no one, no one minds. I usually feel better standing up, but I'll sit. <laughs> um, okay, thank you, Chair. Um, this presentation relates to uh, item seven and item eight on your agenda. Um, the applications are to fell three protected trees. Um, as you'll have seen from the reports, um, both applications have been made on behalf of number 50 Waverley Crescent um, on the ground that the trees are influencing um, their rear extension at number 50. The considerations for the applications are essentially the same. Um, so I'm going to present both applications together, but you will know um, from your agenda pack that there are two separate reports and two separate applications, but this just saves you listening to the same thing twice. Um, so the applications are to essentially fell three protected oak trees. Um, the oak trees form part of a group of about 30 protected oak trees um, to the rear of the properties on Waverley Crescent, numbers 48 to 84. So that group of protected trees is in the green uh, kind of rectangly shape. Um, and in a bit more closer detail, the trees that the applications relate to um, are in the rear gardens of number 48 and number 52 Waverley Crescent, and they're shown with those green circles. Um, so for context, I've got a couple of photographs on the next slide. So this is a photograph of the two protected trees in the rear garden of number 48. And this is a photograph of the protected tree in the rear garden of number 52. And this photo is from Waverley Crescent. Um, you can see from these photographs that um, the trees do contribute to the character and appearance of the area and they provide uh, amenity value. They form a backdrop to Waverley Crescent. Um, and you can see the canopies behind the properties. They're attractive trees. They, they form part of that important attractive group. Um, and ordinarily, we wouldn't support the felling of protected trees. But, as you know, uh, planning is a matter of balancing weight and considerations. Um, and that is what we need to do tonight. So on the one hand, um, from the felling of the protected trees, we've got harm to the character of the area and in itself the loss of protected trees. Um, and that's, that's negative weight. So you can see that in the red on one side of the scales. Um, but we also need to consider where it, whether there is justification for the removal of those trees. Um, and you'll have read from the reports that the applications are made on the grounds that the trees are contributing towards subsidence at number 50. Um, and that's what we need to look at as part of these applications. So uh, number 50 is unsurprisingly uh, situated between number 48 and number 52, but number 50 is shown on this slide in the yellow for you, just for clarity. Um, and those three protected trees are still shown in the green circles. And looking at it from another angle, the oak trees are still shown with the green circles in the rear gardens. Um, and you can see the rear extension at number 50 in that red rectangle. Uh, these photographs are of number 50, um, and they show cracking that's occurring to the rear extension of the property. The extension was built in the 1970s, um, and at that time, it was built with adequate foundations. We have checked that. So we can see that there is damage, essentially, to number 50. Um, then... This slide looks a little bit complicated, but I will talk you through it, um, and hopefully my explanation will make sense. Um, you'll have read from the reports that the trees are implicated in the damage that is occurring. This is because the houses are built on uh, clay, 
which in the summer months, when the ground is driest, um, the trees take up moisture through their roots and the ground contracts. And then on the opposite side, in the winter, when the ground is wetter uh, and the trees are dormant, the ground swells. So this causes a seasonal pattern of movement. Um, as part of the applications, evidence um, has been provided which clearly shows a seasonal pattern of movement, and that's what's shown on this slide. So on this graph, the, the blue and yellow are kind of dotted and diamond lines. They are two points of the extension that were measured. Um, and what you can see is over time, through winter months and summer months, the the movement of th those points in the extension. So what you can see is in the blue columns, which are winter, winter months, you can see that the extension is moving upwards as the ground is swelling. And then in the summer months, which is marked with the red kind of background, you can see that the extension, those two points start to move downwards. And that's when the ground is contracting, when it's driest. Um, so you can see that seasonal pattern of movement on that graph. Um, this pattern of movement is what we expect to see when a building is suffering um, from subsidence. And um, it should be noted that no other subsidence produces this pattern of movement, this seasonal pattern where it moves upwards in the winter and downwards in the summer months. So in addition to the, to the movement, which we've seen, um, that's a clear indicator to us of subsidence, but also the application documents clearly demonstrate that um, a borehole, which was tested at the rear of the extension, and you can see that location with the, with the purple-pink star, um, that, was, that was tested at, at the rear of the extension, and that borehole... Uh, clearly found live oak roots in that borehole. So although the extension is a fairly significant distance from the trees, there were live oak roots found in that, in that location. So um, on balance, back to our scales, um, and as you'll have read in the report, we are satisfied that there is sufficient evidence to indicate that the oak trees are a likely contributory, contributory factor um, implicated in the subsidence at number 50. Um, as such, we can't reasonably recommend refusal um, of consent to fell the trees, um, and as such, it's recommended that both applications are approved subject to conditions which would include replacement planting. Thank you. Thank you. Now I understand Mr. or Mrs. Stephen wish to speak. Um, good evening, I'm Janice Eden, 48 Waverley Crescent. Sorry, could you speak up a little? I'm not Can sure. You? Can you hear me better now? Thank you. Yep. My appeal to the council is that the two oak trees that they want to fell are at the bottom of our 25-metre garden. They house an abundance of wildlife, including owls, birds, squirrels, bats, and insects. It is said they are causing problems to number 50. They are not causing any problems to us or to number 46, and we both have outbuildings. To be concise as possible, Two years ago, by order and threat of prosecution, we had to have seven beautiful fruit trees felled, and then building work was supposed to start at number 70, but it never did. Then, lo and behold, we were told the oak trees needed trimming, and with permission of the council, we obliged. The professional tree experts came and said the fruit trees and oaks had nothing to do with subsidence. So once again, building work was supposed to start on the 31st of October, 23, but never did. Then we were told the end of February, but never did. Then suddenly, out of the blue, approximately the 2nd of February, to our shock and distress, 
we are informed they want to fell the oak trees. Two notices went up and many neighbours are shocked and worried because all have oak trees in their gardens, not just stopping at 48 but going right the way down the other end, causing no problems or damage whatsoever. Please, please help us to save these beautiful oaks. If somebody could come and see our side to the problem, we would be so grateful. If they are felled, they are on a rockery and would have to be dug down so deep, I don't know how we're going to deal with the mess it will cause, and we're both in our mid-70s. Oak trees are all along the back of Waverley Crescent, and nobody has a problem. Many professional people, builders, gardeners, even a number 50s builders, have said the oak trees are causing no damage. Please help us. Um, I could offer you some photos, but I don't know if that's allowed. But thank you very much for listening. Well, we, uh, having lived there for th uh, 48 Waverley Crescent for 32 years, we've never ever had any problems with either the seven established fruit trees or the two 70-foot conifers felled three years ago by Alder. We had to have our two 200-year-old oak trees trimmed, also by Alder. The tree experts all said, all, they all said, the trees, the fruit trees and the oak have nothing whatsoever to do with any land movement or displacement. But in fact, the clay soil in this very changeable weather and uh, foundations for number 50 should have been dug much deeper and underpinned. The oak trees in 200 years have done more for the environment than can possibly be described in my two minutes. No definitive proof. They may have found oak But uh, we don't know that it was these oaks that, uh, that have done it, the roots. No definitive proof of these great oaks causing any land movement at all. But you want to fell them in case, just in case, they might be a problem in the future. Please remember, no definite proof the oaks are the problem. I know it isn't, but if this were a trial at the Central Criminal Court London, the judge would direct the jury and say, if you have the slightest doubt in your mind, the defendant is not, not guilty. You must. It is the law and your duty to acquit. Now, our trees are in the dock under a death sentence. There is no proof, none except the tree experts saying, they are not to blame. Please, please acquit our trees so they can live on and do what they do best for our environment and wildlife in our beautiful county of Essex. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Clark, Clark first, please. I'll go second. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Right, good evening, members. Um, I called this application and a similar one on tonight's agenda to committee for your scrutiny. Um, I'd like my statement to be considered in respect to both applications since they are similar in content and reason. This is not the first time I've addressed this committee regarding TPOs in Runwell, where the recommended action was to destroy established trees at the time, th it was considered an unusual result because the objection was supported by an independent survey and the application was later withdrawn. These trees still stand proudly where they have been for over 250 years and have, there have been no appeals or other actions in respect of those TPOs since. There are similarities to the applications before you tonight. The tree surveys are conducted by arboricultural consultants who usually get the job to fell the trees on behalf of the insurance company who request the survey. Council officers use the information in the survey to recommend the trees are felled based on this survey. 
There is no evidence in these reports that remedial work to contain root growth or the consumption of water has either been adequately tried or recommended. The desire of the applicant to destroy three trees that were over there over 100 years before the plans that house for houses were even considered. I recently went to RHS Hyde Hall and spoke to tree experts who were surprised at the idea an oak tree could cause such damage from this distance, i.e. nearly 30 metres. They also recommended remedial work such as root barriers or crowning. They also warned of the significant effects of ground heave when so many trees are removed from one area, a point curiously denied in the engineer's report. The root barriers can be installed from any distance beyond the recommended distance, which is 12 times the diameter of the trunk or five meters beyond the canopy. This would be possible for all the trees in this application. Crowning is another option for remedial work. It can reduce the consumption of an oak tree by up to 50%. In the current climate conditions, when all tree roots continually search for water, this can be an important factor in controlling the effect of clay soil shrinkage. The properties in this area are all built on London clay and shrinkage can be extreme. With both applications, the reports do not even mention root barriers, let alone the benefits. Surely the title of tree preservation order should mean something. I am disappointed this council has again failed to uphold the protection of TPOs for the, what they were designed to do when deciding the fate of these trees. Especially when challenged by entities such as insurance companies who appear keen on felling every tree anywhere close to a property they are underwriting. I understand the legal advice is to destroy the trees and not to preserve them. How can this be acceptable? It is an easy option and destroys historic landmarks such as established oak trees in these applications. It begs the question, what is the point of the TPO in the first place if we as a council do not preserve them? Furthermore, what is the point of this council declaring a climate emergency when destroying trees such as these, already doing the job of carbon capture, as well as affording the spectacle of landscape? To replace this, we are planting whips, no bigger than twigs in this city, that will not have anywhere near the same effect for at least the next 25 years. The efforts of tackling climate change have been championed by this council in its adopted local plan. By agreeing to this recommendation, it would be contrary to that ideology. We would be making it worse. The history of TPOs in these applications are they protect some 30 trees that line the properties to the rear of Waverley Crescent between numbers 48 and 84. We've already seen an application for crowning in an application in 2022 at 48 Waverley Crescent. This was permitted less than two years ago. This is referenced at point four under other relevant applications in your bundle for both applications. The irony is the obvious typing error corrected in the green paper suggesting this was on the 7th of September 2024 might have been more acceptable time to consider the effects of crowning were it correct. It's not, of course. The note on the footings uh, is interesting because the building reg suggested 1 meter point zero five, uh, 1 0.05 metres at the time the extension was built. Nowadays, two metres is the minimum for this type of soil or piling. The crowning was in response to a claim on the neighbouring property at number 50, again the subject property in this application. The tree at number 52, included in this agenda item, does not appear to have been subject to any pollarding, crowning or any other remedial work. If there were a specific tree linked to the damaged property, it could easily be that one. Again, this cannot be proven. Analysis of tree roots in surveys by the applicant cannot be considered conclusive since DNA forensic analysis can only determine the root 
cannot be determine the root of a specific tree, it can only determine its genus. The recommendation that all three trees be destroyed on that analysis is unacceptable in my opinion. Words in these reports such as alleged, in all probability and most likely all suggest the evidence is not conclusive or definitive. It cannot give the applicant the wider remit of not proving specific calls in, a in an attempt to destroy the trees. Since 2010, there has been one application permitted to fell two trees under the same TPO at number uh, 64, Waverley Crescent. This was in 2019. Members, the applications that it do not consider the other remedial treatments. Is this the precedent under which other applications will be measured by and could result in the destruction of all 30 trees under this TPO? The measures recommended are draconian and unnecessary and I urge members to recommend alternatives to preserve the trees. Finally, if I may add, Chair, when I told the planning officers by email on the 14th of February this year that I, if they were minded to permit these applications, I wish them to be called to this committee for further scrutiny. I was informed by return email the next day my interest was noted and I would be informed in due course. The next notification I received was the same email sent last week to all councillors detailing the agenda for this meeting. So I get seven days to prepare for this and the planning officers get several months. It does not give elected members adequate time to prepare and represent their residents fairly. So I would, if it, I would accept this as an oversight if it was the first time it's happened. Sadly, it is not. Thank you. Thank you. Before we go to the committee, do you wish to come back on anything? I can come back on those points. Excuse um, me, Chair. Councillor Davis was also included in this. I understood that Councillor Davis was not speaking, so if you wish to, that's fine, but you did confuse the committee. No, the comment I made was I'd like Councillor Clark to speak first and I would speak second, Chair. I didn't realise that, okay. so fine. Uh, right, thank you, Madam Chair, for allowing me to address the committee on these planning applications this evening. Um, I fully support the calling in of these applications made by Paul Clark, and I fully support all the comments that he has made in his report. I, too, am incredi incredibly concerned at the perceived lack of preservation of historic trees under TPOs in Runwell and Retterton Ward with a number being felled on St Luke's Park development as a result, whether directly or indirectly, of the... Okay. Again, my <laughs> apologies. Uh, I'll start again, sorry. I, too, am incredibly concerned at the perceived lack of preservation of historic trees under TPOs in the Runwell and Retterton Ward, with a number being felled on the St Luke's Park development as a result, whether directly or indirectly, of the construction that has taken place on the site over the past decade. My primary concern is the ease to which TPOs can be overridden at the whim of insurance companies who would seem to attempt to blame nature rather than the man-made structures surrounding it. Madam Chair, as you and the committee are aware from the agenda pack, there has been a large amount of opposition from local residents about the fending of the trees in question, totaling 45 responses. I feel that the council have given a lack of weight to these concerns again overriding these concerns in favour of one report by an insurance company, whereby, as we've seen from Councillor Clark's report, the language used is circumstantial at best. It appears that one has marked their own homework on this one. I am minded to attest that even though there is subsidence to the extension of the property in question, I would query as to why there doesn't appear to be any evidence of subsidence to the properties where the trees are, or indeed any outbuildings closer to where the trees are situated. One could infer that if effective mitigations were put in place, there would not be an issue of subsidence on any property or outbuilding. We simply cannot continue as a council to be so blasé with T TPOs. I fear that these approvals start to set more than just a precedent. It is starting to set a trend that TPOs are no longer worth the paper they are written on. Therefore, the key question here is this. Are members happy with failing 150-year-old trees based on reports with words such as likely, maybe, and probabilities? I therefore urge the committee not to allow for this 
for application to be approved. Thank you. Right, thank you. I think we're all covered there. Um, would you like to come back? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, bear with me. Uh, I might jump around a little bit, but I'll try and try and do this succinctly. Um, just so you're aware, I've also been in consultation with my natural environment officer, who's sat to my side. Um, so my responses are informed um, by her and on all the preparation work as well. So um, I'm speaking on behalf of myself and our natural environment officer, just to give you some clarification. Um, I'll start with, um, we've heard about other applications in Runwell um, Committee, you'll, you'll be well aware, um, all applications are determined on their own merits, um, we consider information that's put forward with each application, um, we don't consider that previous permissions or refusals grant a precedent um, that's not something we deal with in planning so everything is considered on its own merits um, just in reference to st luke's um, in runwell as well that's the new um, previously runwell hospital development um, it, it is the case that some trees have had to come out there because they're in declining condition um, but so you're aware we've also recently protected a number of trees um, on st luke's um, especially those that are, that are newly planted and are coming to the end of their protection period from the planning conditions. So we've taken that kind of positive step to, to protect those trees. Um, just more generally about TPO trees, um, TPO trees are, are, are protected and that means that we do have to consider the justification and the merits for any works to them. Um, a TPO doesn't mean that no works can take place and actually good tree management does mean that work has to take place um, it the tpo just means that we as officers as natural environment officers yourselves as a members of the planning committee can consider those applications and the reasons put forward for the works um, in terms of the information put forward with the application, um, as with any planning application, reports are submit submitted. We take an independent view of those reports. Um, we assess them, we analyze them independently. Um, it, it's not for us to determine, you know, whether they should be relied on, dependent on who's getting, potentially getting the work to, to or the, uh, commission to carry out the work so we do consider those reports independently um, and assess those and you will have um, read the report and and the documents and will come to your own conclusions uh, in terms of why other properties are not experiencing um, subsidence problems um, routes don't go in one particular direction. You can't predict necessarily where they go. They are going to seek out the best soil conditions for that tree. Uh, so it may be that the roots have gone in this direction because they have found the most moist soil or the most nutritional soil. Um, it also may be the case that roots are found um, in other locations, but they're not necessarily causing subsidence. Those roots could be causing dryness, but soil can vary to a great degree, very close to one another. You've probably experienced it in, in your own garden. You can have certain areas of different types of soil. Um, so that, you know, we're... That, we are satisfied that there is sufficient evidence to say that these roots are causing um, the alleged damage. Just one note on use of language in the report. Um, we use words like alleged and a likely contribu contributory factor. Um, that is partly to do with um, protecting ourselves as officers and as a council. Um, if you were to recommend that the application is refused, then those words in the report give you that element of protection that we've said they're likely, 
Um, but if you were to reach a different conclusion, then you could. If we tie ourselves to they are definitely in a written report, that makes life a bit more difficult further down the line. So that language is not because we are unsure, but it's a, it's a, protection, a protection thing and a use of language. Um, in terms of foundations uh, at the property at number 50, we have checked the foundations with building control. Yes, if that extension was being built today, it probably would have deeper foundations or piled foundations, um, but we have checked with building control, and at the time the extension was built in the 1970s, the foundations would have been adequate. Um, so, you know, we're satisfied that we cannot blame the foundations. Uh, in terms of uh, wildlife, there's separate legislation that protects wildlife. Um, you'll be aware of Habitat Regulations and the Countryside Act. Um, so there are separate duties on anyone carrying out work to ensure that they're not harming bird, like nesting birds or anything like that. Uh, in terms of a site visit, um, my natural environment officer next to me has visited number 50, number 48, uh, and number 52 to see the trees, to see the property. So we, you know, we have looked at this very carefully um, and assessed everything. Uh, we heard about a risk of heave. Um, again, that's been considered in the, the reports that we have independently um, assessed ourselves, and those reports have concluded that there is no risk of heave, so we are satisfied um, with that. What have I missed? Uh, in terms of roots um, and the, the testing of roots and what trees they belong to, uh, there hasn't been DNA testing, so DNA testing of roots would pinpoint exactly which tree the root belongs to. Um, in this case, DNA testing hasn't been undertaken, but that borehole that I showed you on the slide has been tested. That found live roots that were oak roots, and that for us is enough to, to justify that the oak roots are in this location. Um, there is some... Uh, there are some tables in the information that's been presented where one of the tables said it could be oak roots or it could be chestnut roots, um, but that is in the instance where the roots found were less than a millimetre in diameter and simply at that size, it's very difficult to tell whether it's an oak or a chestnut, but the, the borehole that's, that we showed on the slide where they found larger roots, they were conclusively... Um, determined to be oak roots. Um, and finally, I suppose, just for yourselves, members, um, we are not saying that these trees have to be felled. We are simply recommending that consent could be granted for the removal of the trees. So we are not saying they have to be removed. We are saying they could be removed. Um, you'll note from the report and the, the slides that the trees are in the ownership of both neighbouring properties. Um, ultimately, those neighbouring properties have control over their, their own trees. Um, we are not dictating to anybody that those trees have to come out. We are simply saying, in terms of the tree preservation order, there is, in our view, sufficient evidence to justify the, the removal of those trees. Um, I think that's it for public and uh, councillor comments, but I'm happy to answer any other questions. Okay, thank you. I think this is an emotive problem here. Uh, I think right, Councillor Thompson, would you like to start? Thank you, Chair. I think we could be here a while. <laughs> um, um, I, um, I have to say, I, I felt that the councillors for Rettenden and Runwell um, you know, did a good job of putting their case for their uh, their evidence in, in this instance, and there were perhaps some points they raised that may that maybe weren't just covered there, and that I would like to just press a little bit further. Um, a key one for me is that um, I'm absolutely no agricultural expert at all, but is 
is it, could it possibly be feasible that an action short of removing the trees could help ameliorate uh, the, pr the problems? Um, Sorry, yes, that was on my list and I forgot to answer it when I was trying to work out if I'd answered everything. I knew there was something as soon as you went on to that, I thought, oh, I've missed it. Um, so this is the consideration of um, whether crown reduction would suffice or whether a root barrier would suffice. Um, in short, and you will have heard that crown reductions were undertaken um, Previously, uh, consent was granted in 2022 for those works. Um, those crown reductions have not, have not solved the problem, um, essentially. So further crown reductions are unlikely to resolve the situation. Um, in terms of a root barrier, um, it, root barriers are a possibility. Uh, firstly, you'll be aware from other planning applications that we have to consider the proposal that is in front of us, and that is to fell the trees. Um, but also root barriers are not always necessarily a, a, a solution. They, they may not work. Um, it would be a sus substantial cost um, to install a root barrier because that would not only need to cover number 50, but it may also need to cover the two neighbouring properties. Um, cutting roots of a mature tree like that to install a root barrier, um, and dependent on what distance you were to install that, installing that root barrier could have a negative effect on the tree's health anyway. If you're cutting, um, if you're cutting a major root and putting a barrier in place, that um, will likely result in a in a declining tree, in which case we may then you know we're likely to end up with an application to fell the tree because it's in a declining state. Um, and you know if a tree is declining, its stability is affected, and then we have a risk of falling in high winds in winter in storms. Um, let me just check. Um, sorry, just uh, I was just checking. I haven't missed anything in in relation to the technicality of installing a root barrier and the likely impact on the trees. Um, as I said at the as I said at the start, we're considering the proposal that's put before us, and that's felling the trees. Um, if if you if members were not happy with felling the trees and wanted a root barriers to be put in place. That would be a new application. Um, the complication um, and the risk with these um, tree and subsidence applications is that if the council refuse consent to remove the tree, um, and bear in mind I'm not a lawyer at this point, so this isn't formal legal advice, but it's my understanding of of the position. If the council were to refuse consent to fell the trees, the council would then become liable for any damage that was caused. Um, so if you were to refuse consent for the felling of the trees and further damage were to take place, even during the course of investigating a root barrier or installing a root barrier, or if the, if the root barrier is installed and it's not effective, the city council is liable for that damage. Um, that is a financial consideration that we do have to have as well. Um, as I say, I'm not a, not a lawyer, but it is a factor to bear in mind. Um, to refuse consent, we would need to essentially have evidence that it is not these trees that are causing the damage we'd need to have definitive evidence to say trees aren't anything to do with it. Um, put simply, 
based on the seasonal pattern of movement and the oak roots that have been found and the damage that we can see on those photographs, we can't, we can't say that and we can't, we can't recommend that the trees are not causing any damage. Um, sorry, that's a bit, a bit heavy <laughs> and a, a bit to the point. Um, apologies. <laughs> Well, we need all the information we can get, Councillor Hall. Yeah, I just want to understand, really, you know, if you're an app, the applicant, I guess, and you're, you're buying a property and you know that there's a protected tree in there, um, you should have a building survey done um, and you, you buy the house or buy the property, you know, with that knowledge. Um, and, and, you know, you know that, that there is a risk that that tree could affect your house. That was one point, more of an observation, and I nothing's been said in, in terms of the applicant's liability on this for doing that. Um, I don't know how long this person has lived there and, you know, sort of when the building survey was done, but you have to have a building survey when you buy a house. So um, I'd be interested in, 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 in how that sort of fits into that. Um, you know, if there's a tree preservation order, it should be on the building survey. Um, the second thing, you know, in this day and age, I think um, there should be ways of, of, of mitigating this issue, you know, rather than felling the tree. And I appreciate what you're saying. The, the, the other issue, I think, is... Um, what was the other issue I was going to say? Um, I've forgotten it. I'll come back to you. Maybe you can come back on that. I mean, we, we have to take what we see in front of us at this point in time. Am I correct? Yes, that's all. So, okay. Councillor Sam. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I think that point about the balance between kind of a building and a tree, both of which are really important, is a fair one to make. But often when we're talking about a tree preservation order or, or something felling any trees, even if they don't have a preservation order, you're talking about a business that's going to provide quite significant improvements to the area or employment or things like that or you're talking about a significant new development where a number of homes are going to be built in this case we're talking about one large detached home who might lose a bit of their extension I think the point you make about whether the council is financially liable for that is concerning and like probably the main point we've heard that would make me reconsider so possibly want to dig into that a bit more but for everything else, you know, I think some people have made some good points that this tree was there decades before the owners of this house and hopefully will be decades afterwards. So although it's really disappointing that the kind of, particularly with more extreme weather patterns, this is having an impact and I can really sympathize with that owner that they didn't foresee that. Um, you know, I, don't, I actually don't think the answer to this is cutting down more trees because that's a vicious cycle that we're kind of already in in this city and elsewhere. So, yeah, for me, it's about council's liability for the damage. Um, apart from that, I don't think I've personally had a good reason why that tree preservation order should be removed. Thanks, Councillor Walsh. Yeah, I just had a question. So, on the so there's tree trees that are identified that's been removed, and the borehole has a has identified um, oak roots, but you also mentioned that there is a way of doing another test which would identify the DNA of the roots, maybe. So could we, you know, hone it down that not all of the three, not all trees need to be removed, that maybe just one of them that's causing the problem? Um, put simply, we don't have the ability to DNA test roots. Um, that's a very technical, uh, process that would need to be carried out by by an independent arboriculturist with the right equipment um, so we, we cannot cannot do that and it comes back to the point that we we're, we're having to consider the applications that are submitted to us um, you know if we coming back to the liability point and I don't know whether our legal advisor will just clarify that for you um, I don't know if you want to do that now, William, or in a moment, maybe just confirm whether I'm correct. <laughs> uh, bear with us a minute. We seem to have trouble with the... the let's see if they work. Brilliant. 
Yes, yeah, sorry, Kirsty. I uh, Chair, I don't know whether you want me to sort of um, advise now or whether you want to continue the, um, the discussion and then I can come in at the, um, the end, whatever. Shall we finish the discussion then first and then you can come in? Thank you. Who else uh, wishes to speak? Councillor Hine. Thank you, Chair. Um, the officers said uh, the earlier crowning hadn't been effective. Um, and my question was, how do we know that any subsequent damage to the building has it progressed? Has it got worse after that crowning? And again, I guess, do we know, is it through lack of non-maintenance of your building, looking after your, um, your own uh, fixtures and fittings, or tree damage? Because we're making a flying leap here in that um, the crowning was not effective, then it could be that whatever issue was with the building in the first place has just deteriorated with lack of maintenance. Yep, I can answer that. Uh, bear with me, I'll just get a slide up on the screen to help with the answer. Um, okay, so we're back to this slightly complex looking graph. Um, I'm hoping you can read the dates on the bottom. I may have to stand up and point, but let me know. Um, the Crown reductions were undertaken around October 2022. Um, and if, so if you can pinpoint um, the 10.22 on the bottom line, I think you can see the cursor on there. Perfect, thank you. Um, so you can see those, the blue and yellow lines, um, just as a recap, are, are the, the points of movement that were measured. From October 2022 onwards, you can still see that there is movement. Um, so that would indicate that the, the, the crown reductions have not been effective at removing that, that movement pattern. Um, the, the roots are, are still there and they are still causing this seasonal pattern of movement. May I just, I'm no building engineer, but if the building is already defective, the movement would continue, regardless of the tree structure. I'm no building engineer, so forgive me for making that assessment. Sorry, I'll pass over to my expert. <laughs> um, so it's the rehydration of soil that indicates that it's the vegetation, because if it wasn't the vegetation, you wouldn't be seeing that rehydration, that up back again in winter. That's how we know it's related to the vegetation. Councillor Saw, perhaps. Thank you, Chair. Um, as I understand it, the building damage that we're talking about here is only to the extension which was built in the 1970s, not the core part of the house. So, uh, therefore, there's no risk that the main house could become condemned or unlivable. In that case, it does seem that uh, it's the way in which the extension was, was constructed that is really at issue here. I accept the foundations may have been the correct depth for the 1970s, as is reported, um, but I'd counter that, only, that that's only one aspect of build quality. This brings me, I suppose, onto the point about liability that, that we were discussing. Uh, potential liability, it would seem to me, is probably quite small because it's only going to relate to the actual extension, the 1970s extension, which, by all accounts, uh, is perhaps of quite poor quality. Um, I was going to ask if the legal officer could actually confirm this point that the council would be liable, but I, I think you said you were, going to, you were going to comment after the committee had spoken. Um, for me, the distance between the trees and the extension at the rear of the property looks to be roughly 90 feet, and it feels really quite a stretch to believe that trees so far from the property could be causing subsidence. I don't deny there is subsidence, but for me, the report doesn't provide sufficient evidence to say on the balance of probabilities, which I think is what we're being asked to decide on tonight, that these particular trees are causing the issue. The officer's report talks about tests and details reports that have been undertaken, but we don't have those documents in the papers. When researching this issue online, all the literature that I found talks about trees 
that are, that are significantly closer to buildings causing subsidence, generally under 10 metres. But I couldn't find an example of where a tree was detailed to have caused subsidence uh, that was you know, approaching 90 feet from the building. What is to say that it isn't the London clay principally that's causing the subsidence? The report talks a lot about London clay and it does seem that that, that surface in itself is, is a cause of issue. There's also no discussion in the report about pollarding. Has this been investigated as well as crowning? And it was mentioned that a crowning exercise was undertaken in October 22 and that there's been no impact on subsidence. But as Councillor Highland was saying, um, the subsidence is now in place. And my understanding is as well that it can take a few years actually for the benefits of crowning to be felt in this sort of situation. Uh, the crowning also, I think, needs to be an ongoing exercise taken perhaps every few years. So I'm not really convinced that enough of a time period has lapsed that we can say that the crowning undertaken in October 22 didn't work. Um, and I'm also sympathetic to some of the points raised by uh, the councillors from the ward, um, saying that if we did approve the felling this evening, that would this not set a dangerous precedent uh, for any TPA on a tree that is within 90 feet of a building could effectively be felled um, because there could be, uh, and we can't say definitively that it wouldn't cause subsidence to a building within 90 feet. So um, thank you, those are my points, thank you. Thank you. Well, I think we are in, you know, we're in sympathy with both sides here. Um, Councillor Thompson. Thank you for bringing me back in. I I'm afraid I have about four or five questions, and the thing is, I, I, I crave the chair and the committee's indulgence because if whether I'm satisfied or not by the answer is probably going to affect the way I'm going to vote here. Um, first thing to say um, is that obviously we've got experts over here and we've got generalists here. Hopefully, nobody here is suddenly presenting themselves an agricultural expert. So I'm sorry if it, it, it irritates you, but we really need to be satisfied here. Um, so. Question number one, will the removal of the trees stop the subsidence at number 50? Do you want to finish your questions and then we go oh, back God, to Oh, God, sorry, that was a dramatic trees. effect. Now, um, so, <laughs> um, uh, my second question is, is there such thing as an acceptable level of subsidence? Again, from... From what I can see there, that in it looks to me as though the difference in the reading was really quite a lot at 10.22 when that was done, and that we seem to have narrower differences since. I'm no expert, but could it be that the crowning has had some positive effect but hasn't completely stopped the subsidence? And therefore, whilst I absolutely agree, we... We consider what's before us, and we don't propose something else, but if we feel uh, that the tree removal is excessive, we can refuse. Um, so, yeah, is there such a thing as an acceptable level of subsidence? And um, as we don't have the DNA testing, is it, are we definitely felling the right trees? Um, and that... that that is quite concerning, the thought that we could possibly be cutting down a tree without actual definitive proof that it's the right one. Okay. I think we're in a cleft stick here. Can you yep, come I, back can, possible? I can. I can come back. Um, we've, we've had some consultation. Um, First question, will it stop Stop that? Um, we, we can't say 100% it will definitely stop it. No one can predict the future to 100%. But what we can say is that removing those live, removing that tree and removing the, the liveness of that tree, stopping that moisture draw from the soil, that will prevent that seasonal pattern of movement, which um, as we've explained, you only get with vegetation. Um, and that is the reason that we can confidently say it's not just the clay soil that is the cause. 
um, because if it was just the clay soil, you would you would not get this seasonal up and down when the tree is drawing the moisture away and when the soil is wetter. Um, is there an acceptable level of subsidence? Um, I, I think that is a is not a planning consideration as such. That would come down to um, liability risk, um, and that's not something that we would want to say there is subsidence, but it's acceptable because ultimately that would put us liable for for the for any future damage, and that that's a big risk. Um, just on costings, my understanding is that it would be quite a substantial cost and, and liability to the council. I believe it was about £50,000. I'm looking at Sarah for a nod. Was that what was mentioned earlier? I, th I think it, it's quite a substantial um, risk in, in my understanding and my view. Um, but as I say, I'm, I'm no expert on, on building costs or liability. Um, and finally, just on the matter of um, the crown reductions that took place in October 2022 and the difference in those readings, um, cast your mind back to the summer of 2022 when we were just coming out of COVID times. That was an incredibly hot year. That was an incredibly hot summer. We were seeing the effects of climate change, I think it is fair to say. Um, so that that drop is probably fairly dramatic at that point because of that very dry summer. Um, so it's it may not have been such a dramatic drop last summer because last summer was not so hot or or dry. Um, and finally, just on the point of whether this is the right trees. Um, these are the closest oak trees within the zone of influence, essentially. So we are, we are satisfied that um, the proposal is, is for the right trees um, and it, it, it would be highly, highly unlikely that it would be another tree because they would simply be too far away. Um, we usually look... Um, 30 metres is generally... The, the distance, the oak trees can be seen to cause influence. Um, these trees are, I think, 27 to kind of 30 metres away. So they are on the higher limit of that distance. Um, any other trees, I, th I think it's fair to say they would be too far away. But, but you know, the, these ones are, are the closest and are in that zone. Thank you. Unless... Oh, Councillor Lee. Thank you, Chair. I think some of these points have probably been covered. Um, just going back to the fact that this is the only building affected, um, I do take your point that routes can potentially move in mysterious ways, so there is that possibility. Um, though there is the garage between the trees and that extension. Uh, I was just wondering if there's any movement on that garage at all. Um, your comment that two out the th well the the distance the trees are away, I thought two out of the three were just over the thirty meters. I'm happy to be corrected, but I thought the report suggested that, and the insurance suggests thirty meters is the safe distance, and we all know how much insurance companies like to cover themselves, so I would give weight to that thirty meters. I do accept, though, that yes, roots were found in the bore, which was more, yeah, which was 30 metres away. Um, a point that was raised earlier on, I think the trees, I think we accept the trees are possibly a contributing factor, but the, how much of a factor is a million dollar question, and I don't have a huge confidence that this is a massive sort of the factor that is causing the subsidence. Uh, again, a point that was covered earlier on, the three trees, uh, it might be one, it might be two, it might be three, it might be none of them. Uh, I think it was T4 on one of your plans, which is a fraction further away. Why, why is that one not included as well if we're just filling all these trees? Um, root barrier, again, I think we've discussed that. Um, 
the, there was a conifer removed in, I think it was 2001, 2002. Um, could you explain where that ties in with that graph and whether heave could, that could have caused heave, so that could be a cause of subsidence? Um, and I would, again, a point that's been made before, the value of TPOs. Um, we put them on there for a reason, on trees for a reason, to protect them. Uh, we've got three mature oak trees here, which I believe are around 250 years old. Uh, three mature oaks, 250 years old, versus one extension at 50 years old. What do I feel is more valuable? I I'm I'm, would suggest the trees. Um, any other points? Um, the heave situation, removing this, these trees and the experts say it won't cause heave. Uh, just to note that the notes to applicant at the end of the report, it does state removal of the tree could cause heave. So, thank you. Is there anything you want to answer? I'll go to... Uh, I can just answer very quickly. Yeah. Couple, couple more bits. Um, if I just show you a photograph quickly, if we can get the right slide. Um, this is about the garage at the end of the garden. We have got a, f a f closer photograph. I don't know if you'll be able to see it in that photograph, but you can can see like a crack in the garage towards the back. Obviously, we haven't got any reports or any information about what may have caused that, but that's a photograph there for you. Um, that's all I'm gonna, gonna say on that. I, I don't know whether that's the tree or not, um, but that's a photograph of the side of the garage. Uh, in terms of the distances, you are right. One is 28.4 meters away, one is 30.7, and one is 30.6. Um, you know, we say 30 metres is that zone of influence. I think 0.7 and 0.6 in the, in the scheme of 30 metres, 0.7 and 0.6 is, is not so great to completely rule those trees out, um, in my opinion. Um, and I've forgotten if you had any more specific questions, sorry. Uh, the conifer. Um, uh, did you say that was removed in 2001? I'm not sure it was 2001, 2002. Either way, that, that graph doesn't go back that far. That, that level monitoring was uh, 2020 onwards. So it doesn't go back, back that far. So you won't see anything to do with the removal of that conifer on that graph. Um, but those trees oh. were, some conifers were removed, weren't yeah. there? Yeah, I believe oh, so, yeah. The reason I don't, I can't tell you the reason. Um, I don't I know that. I thought it was in the um, report, sorry. sorry. Yeah, I'm told, I'm told it was. But again, this, the pattern of movement that we're seeing is from 2020 onwards. So I think it's fair to say that, you know, that's occurred way beyond the removal of those conifers. Uh, just one more point about the heave. Um, I think the concluding point on the uh, engineer's report about there may be heave comes down to them probably covering liability from themselves, which you see a lot in, in reports. And as I say, you can never predict what may happen in the future. Their opinion is that it's unlikely to cause heave, but they're covering themselves for, for any future risk. Right, thank you. Uh, Councillor Walsh. Yeah, just a question on the roots again that came up on the borehole drilling. Do we know that whether they're all from one tree or actually multiple trees? And um, I think of another point, but anyway, yeah, that's... All we know is that they are oak roots in that borehole. They are live oak roots. We can tell that they're live from the starches that are present. Um, so we know that there are live oak roots there. We can't tell how many trees, which specific tree, but we can tell that they are oak. Right, yeah, thank you. Sorry, yeah, the other questions were, so the trees that have been removed in the past have all been removed because of issues with this extension. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. 
Councillor Lee. Apologies, thank you. Um, the, could you put up a plan showing the trees that are covered by the TPO? Yep, I have the and TPO plan as one of my slides. Bear with you. me. And I've got a question uh, relating to that. Down. Once it's up. Uh, So this is the TPO plan. Um, it's a group preservation order. So um, the 30 oak trees in that dotted black line are the protected trees. Okay, there was another plan that we saw earlier on that showed the trees more specifically, I thought. Uh, yeah, we've got, a photo we've got a photograph of okay, the trees the, with green, green dots on. That one, if you get that one up. Uh, go down one, that. Oh, no. That's a photograph of the three trees. Right, there was, a, there was another one, I'm <laughs> uh, sure, go. that showed a... But basically, how Sorry. close is the next closest one? We've got three trees here we're discussing. How close is the next closest one? That's my question. I thought one of these did demonstrate that, but I can't see it. Uh, I don't think we have got a plan that shows the next closest okay. trees but they're they're way beyond it might be this plan yeah, no, that, that you saw that is the one there yeah so that was the one so yeah so how close is t5 uh well t4 is 30.6 meters um so my guess would maybe be 35 i don't i that, no. that's the guess yeah. but over 30.6 Okay. Yeah, yeah, I'd agree. <laughs> Sorry. It's further, I'd agree. It's further away. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, I don't have the the distance to T five um, off off hand, but yeah, if the if thirty meters is generally considered the zone of influence, and we're saying you know that the point six point seven is is probably that borderline, we wouldn't want to argue over it. I think T five is probably far enough away that it's it's not that. Councillor Harland, if you wanted to come thank, back. Thank you. Just on the picture where you showed the group, the group photo of the, the, the group drawing uh, of there. So I guess if you're going to approve this felling, then you're going to remove the TPO just from the trees that you're felling or all the 30 group because it's a group TPO? Um, when we grant consent to fell a TPO, we don't remove the TPO at all. Oh. Um, so the TPO would just stand as it is uh, without the tree. Um, we are recommending replacement planting. Uh, we could then look at putting a tree preservation order on those replacement trees once they have been planted, which is something that we do generally do because they have been planted to compensate for the loss of a TPO. Um, but the, the TPO as it is can remain as it is, um, and we will just have on, on our background and our file that those three trees were, were felled, if they were to be felled. Thank you. Um, question I had, you mentioned the tree next to the, um, to a shed, just now. Did I misunderstand where that was? Which, which, the previous tree that looked as if it had some damage on it. That's which, in. Which, <laughs> which garden is that in? 52. 52. So that is one the of the trees we're fact. talking about? Yeah. I just wanted to be clear. Yep, yeah, that was one of the trees we are talking about, which was next to that garage and the photograph, which we showed earlier. There you go, on that one. Uh, oh, so, yeah, that, that's 52. Yeah, of course, a, ga a tree that close to a garage could easily... Of course it could, up, yeah. Of course, which is a different thought, isn't it? Yeah. Um, but the trees are considered to be well, all of them, at the moment. Yeah? Okay, thanks. Uh, Council... Yes, Council Walls, I, I will... Yeah, just on the photograph and how that relates to the map on page 55... So, is the garage C1, or is there a garage that should be on that drawn that's not shown? Um, typically, I don't actually have that, that plan <laughs> that you're referring to. Um, if we can go back to a different slide, we can point out the garage.
So um, if you can see on this plan, the garage actually is it's not the garage that's C1, if that's what you're asking. That gar The garage would be further right at the back of the uh, gardens, essentially under the canopy of those trees. So it's not on that not on okay. that plan. So the garage, I think the question originally was, is that one C1? So no. is there any issues with C1, which is closer to those trees than the extension? We haven't got any reports to consider um, the, the building at C1, so I couldn't tell you. Okay. Right, um, unless anybody wants to say anything else, can we pass on to our legal expert, please? We need that information. Thank, thank you, Chair. Um, so um, what, what I can do is give the committee some advice on the um, compensation provisions um, and how it basically works um, if you have a compensation claim. But um, feel free, when I finish, to, to ask me any questions. If it's not clear, it's a little bit complex and convoluted. So. Um, Kirsty is, is, is spot on. There is a um, statutory right um, to compensation. Um, it's actually found in Regulation 24 of the um, Town and Country Planning Tree Preservation England Regulations of 2012. And basically what that says is that you know, a person is entitled to compensation if they can establish, so if they can prove that they have suffered loss or damage in excess of 500 pounds as a result of a refusal of consent to fell a tree. So um, potentially, therefore, um, yeah, if the committee were to refuse consent, um, you could, the, the, the council could find itself subject to a compensation claim, uh, the claimant would have to show on the evidence um, that basically there is damage and con likelihood of continuing damage um, because the tree is still in situ. And um, potentially the council could be looking at covering the cost of um, Yes, works which could include underpinning works. So, you know, they they can run into um, thousands of pounds in in my experience. And it's fair to say that the council has had um, claims of this nature in the past. So um, we we do get them. Um, so the way it works is that you have a claim. If you dispute it, then the claimant is entitled to go to an independent tribunal. Um, and the tribunal actually, when it looks at it, goes on the evidence and it actually applies the balance of probability test. So in other words, is it more likely than not that this particular tree or trees are causing damage, subsidence to the property? And if the tribunal comes to that view, then yes, you know, council will be liable to, to pay compensation. So um, in a nutshell, there, there's certainly, I mean, look, I, can, uh, I don't have the technical, obviously the tec technical knowledge of trees or indeed um, building structures. Um, you know, looking at the officer report, I think it's fair to say that the officer report does does indicate that there is certainly evidence to indicate that these trees are in fact causing subsidence to the extension. If that is the case, then yes, Regulation 24 is unequivocal. The council would be liable to pay compensation. So when you're actually, when you're actually determining this application, um, from a legal standpoint, what you really need to do is to, it is a balancing exercise, so you need to take into account the amenity value of the tree or trees, um, and then balancing that with the damage or the, the likely damage to the private property. And then if, you ref if you're minded to refuse the consent, then you need obviously 
to take into account the fact that the council could could well be liable to you know have to pay compensation um, my own experience of these cases is that if they do go to the tribunal then clearly the claimant has their expert evidence so uh, the council would need to get its own um, expert evidence um, to to um, to basically fight that that claim so they can be quite complex they can be in my experience quite expensive to to deal with but as Kirsty has said it's still open to the committee to refuse consent but the important thing certainly from my standpoint and from fellow officers standpoint is the committee is aware of among other things the in my view fairly high risk of having to pay out compensation um, I don't know Kirsty did you did you say it could be in the region of 50,000 I don't know that was no. that was just okay. my yeah. guess so ignore that mm -hmm. thank you so I hope that helps but if anybody has any any questions please ask Kirsty Um, thank you for that. That was useful. Um, now, if we were minded to approve the felling of these trees and the landowners don't do it as they are entitled to, um, who then is liable? Well, the, the straight answer to that is the council wouldn't be liable because it's given consent. Um, but as my colleagues um, said because the my understanding is these trees are on private land that is not in the ownership of the applicant um, the council can give consent but it's still open to the owners to refuse to allow those trees to be felled um, I don't think I can really go beyond that I mean clearly as a matter of general law if you have a tree on your land which um, is, is causing um, problems to somebody's building, then there is a potential liability. Um, but that wouldn't be for the council to, to worry about. Right. I think we have had a very thorough look at this. And I think it's a really hard decision for us to make. Um, we have heard from the officers, we've heard from the legal team. So at the moment, unless anyone else wants to speak, I will put the application forward for our decision. Sorry, Chair, can I just, just a reminder, we've got the two applications that I we'll need to put. Perfect, thank you. The first is item seven. Works to tree subject to a TPO 48 Waverley Crescent Runwell that the application be approved for conditions on paint same of their report. Do, we ha do I have a seconder for that? We do have a seconder. In that case, all those in favor of that particular work to trees that's three four can, can I confirm you're saying approval to fell yes we're talking about approval to fell the trees as per the officer's report so please can I see who is in favor of that Okay, yes. and those against, four. So is that carried? Yeah. It is carried, but as we said, we can only recommend, that's our position. So it is carried. I'll move on to item eight, work to treat subject to TPO 52, Waverley Crescent. Um, that be the felling of those trees is recommended 
Do I have a seconder? I do. In that case, all those in favour of that particular application? One, two, three, four, five. Am I right? Yeah. All those against? Ah. Oh. In that case, I have the casting vote, in which case I will go with the officers to recommend felling. But again, it's his only recommendation. Are you happy with that information? It's not, it's not a recommendation, Chair. It's, 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 a, it's our decision. Is that it's our decision. Sorry. We're not making people fell these trees. Okay, but we have said they can be done. Thank you. Am I covered? I am. Thank you, everybody. I know this has been really hard. Can I just move on then to planning appeals um, for your own observations? Okay, thank you very much. That's the end of the meeting tonight.